Beside me is Frances Morris. She is the Director Emerita of Tate Modern, and she led the institution for seven years. Notable exhibitions she has curated include retrospectives of Louise Bourgeois, Yayoi Kusama, and Agnes Martin. More recently, she co-curated Hilma af Klimt and Piet Mondrian, Forms of Life, for Tate Modern and the Kunstmuseum Den Haag. As Director of Collections, International Art from 2006 to 2016, Francis led the transformation of Tate's international collection, strategically broadening and diversifying its international reach and representation. The upshot of all that is that there are very few um, veterans of museums as um, influential and as authoritative as Francis, and that's why I invited her to talk about what sustainability means within the context of museums. So, these are really big questions and we have half an hour, so we're gonna have fun. Um, so Francis, to begin, what are the biggest changes you've, you've observed over the past 20 years since you've been in the industry for 30? Okay, well firstly, thank you for having me here. And I have to say it's the first time, but probably not the last time that I've been called a veteran. Anyway, oh here God, I am, sorry. a veteran. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Um, oh, what has changed? Uh, I think uh, 30 years I've moved from certainty to doubt, uh, from security to insecurity. But of course, the art world itself has seen an extraordinary period of growth um, in this country, the proliferation of great public spaces like First Sight, uh, the length and breadth of the UK. Tate has turned into a, from a parochial little 19th century museum to uh, a global brand with four great spaces in the UK across the world. Uh, museums have multiplied ad infinitum. The, the dial has shifted from a kind of Euro-American centre in New York to China. Um, in terms of uh, museum growth, the marketplace has, you know, was hardly featured in my world when I began as a curator at Tate in the late 80s. Of course, the marketplace is everywhere. Um, I think we have, uh, you know, uh, art fairs now. We have 200 a year. There were, I think, you know, one or two a year uh, when I first started. So th there's been this extraordinary period of growth and proliferation, but at the same time, it's been a period of really quite um, enormous contraction. So I joined uh, the public sector when the public sector meant pretty much 100% government funding uh, with an ethos of service, public service. I uh, step aside as a veteran when that has diminished <laughs> to about 30% of the purse of a public institution like Tate. So the, the balance between public and private has completely uh, been reconfigured to, uh, with some extraordinary and problematic consequences. Now, now, what do you think it is that has actually led to the explosion of the industry? It's geometric growth, not just of museums. I mean, just the entire sector has become uh, um, huge compared to where it was in the 80s when it was quite an esoteric pursuit to look at art. Well, we could talk about neoliberalism. Okay. We talk no, about, let's talk, about, no, no, let's whole, talk about big ideas. A shift from a kind of, uh, I suppose, a welfare state, a sort of social contract to... Um, uh, a money market, an investment market, the rise of a growing, uh, a new uh, community of investors and collectors in parts of the world that, you know, became free uh, from their chains in the 1990s. Um, the, uh, and and, and uh, uh, therefore a market economy taking the place to a degree of the, the public purse in the uh, ecology of art as a whole. And I think really a major shift in the, the nature of collecting from being an interest-based collecting, a kind of, uh, um, of old-fashioned connoisseurial model to art as a, a solid investment. And we live in risky times and art has become more and more a safe place to put your funds. And that has brought a huge amount of money into the business at a time when, of course, the a gap between rich and poor gets ever greater and money is concentrated in ever fewer hands, but in such great quantities that it has fueled this exponential growth in the higher echelons of the, uh, the art. Do you think ecosystem? that museums or galleries or auction houses would have been their respective roles in fueling that growth? 
Well, it, you know, it's difficult to pick out individual roles within a in an ecology where everything connects to everything. Um, I think museums and galleries have been partly victims of the growth of the market, but they've also been partly uh, complicit. So it's a kind of little bit, you know, there is a symbiosis, but symbiosis can be good and it can be bad. And I think certainly during the 90s, in my first proper decade at Tate, it was incredibly exciting, the idea that we were having to, in a way, take our future into our own hands. And it drove within the public sector a sense of kind of entrepreneurialism and a need to reinvent the self which I think was really very positive um, museums kind of we transformed ourselves and I'm not just talking about Tate I'm talking about um, you know all public institutions from being dependencies to being having a sort of sense of autonomy and drive entrepreneurship uh, uh, yes in a, in a good way um, they know there was we always used to talk about the two art histories that when I joined the Tate there was what happened in the universities which was research based which was quite dynamic was reflective of the world and what happened in institutions which was very old fashioned it was like taking care of your collection um, uh, a very kind of old fashioned model and what happened in the 90s is, is that division between the institution and the world began to dissolve because we had to become players in the real world. You previously said once uh, that the museum used to function as a hospital, church, and school, and so now its defining purpose has really changed. So you elaborate a little bit more on what you were just saying. Well, I think when you look at mission statements, I'm always interested in institutional mission statements, and actually Tate's mission statement, which was founded, which was written in the early 90s, and it was a, you know, it's a governmental... Um, across the board DCMS uh, thing focuses almost exclusively on uh, a mission to increase understanding and enjoyment of art and very much a sense of a kind of show and tell model that here in the institution the institution holds the knowledge holds the value and has the uh, responsibility the mission to share that with its public but in the in the, in, the, in the decades since that moment, I think we have, maybe it's to do with, partly to do with the diminishment of public space in other areas. Institutions have begun to take on a much wider and broader and more civic purpose, which I think is a good thing. And I remember when I, you know, for much of my career at Tate, I wasn't involved I was peripherally involved in the institution. I was either driving the collection or working on the displays. But when I became the director of Tate Modern in 2016, there were two very important reports that were published that year. One was the Warwick Report, which was a UK-based report done by Warwick University, which um, it, was, it was really quite horrifying. It talked about the... Uh, demonst it demonstrated a, 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 a deep kind of fissure or loss in public um, trust in museums. And it, it had data to suggest that museums and public, um, uh, public cultural provision were, were witnessing a very rapid and significant falling off in public attendance from c lower economic, uh, socially disadvantaged communities, and in particular with young people. And it pointed to a sort of crisis in the, 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 the point, the utility, the, 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 um, the public service of the museum. And that the same year, there was a report by the Golbenkian Foundation, which was looking at the, again, addressing what is the purpose of the museum. And the, the report made a very profound and really persuasive case that in the second decade of the 21st century, museums uh, had shifted from places that just held the belief, if you like, to places that, that, that had a very important uh, social, economic, 
spiritual, educational community function in their environments. And uh, described the uh, institution in really lovely metaphors. So that the museum was no longer just the museum that you walked up the stairs to to have a kind of experience, an aesthetic experience, but a place uh, it was that was partly the function of a school, of a um, a park, a place where people of all um, uh, all backgrounds could meet. In, in a safe space. Uh, the museum was a place uh, for learning and education, a space of debate, a place of, of, of safety and security like a home. And I think in, the, in that period, with the, ironically, as the state has withdrawn its financial support of public institutions, the public institution has in turn taken on some of the responsibilities of the state in having to provide for uh, um, you know, for services and experiences that still that simply don't exist any longer in our, our, our in our, in society. Well, that's good news. Um, that would unfortunately validate a Tory agenda to to do defund the arts. But I want to refer to the fall off in trust of museums that you mentioned in the Warwick report. That's undoubtedly due to the loss of public funding and greater reliance on the private sector to, um, for, for, for museums to operate. And I wanted to ask you about the shifting power relationship because it's big. It's one of the most shocking things that I discovered talking to you, that museums are no longer in pole position. As a member of the public, I used to always consider museums to be top dog, that they're setting the agenda, they're validating, and um, making, making certain artists very collectible and credible. And then, but you, you, you actually told me that that was no longer the case. Well, there are two, th there are two things at play there. I think, first, firstly, your statement that... Um, that uh, uh, fall off and trust. Fall off and trust. I think that I don't think that it it, it is entirely. Um, I mean, I think I think the museums are and public art centres are partly responsible for that falling off in public trust, because what we've seen, uh, uh, museums have very much held to the position that they know best. Okay. Okay. So, and I think at the same time, we, of course, museums are the absolute centre of expertise and knowledge. And uh, you know, Tate, for example, has a you know a, uh, an extraordinary community of art historians and scholars, and uh, you know, almost scientific experts who work on conservation. So it's an extraordinary uh, public resource of expertise. But of course, you know that has to be balanced by the lived experience of our audiences, and there is a there is a, an urgency for uh, uh, for museums and public centres to to find a point of connection with their audiences. And I think perhaps over um, you know that museums and art galleries can do more to reach out and provide the kind of welcome that people want. You know, I always felt very strongly that museums have a tendency to make people feel stupid. And it's be, being, being made to feel stupid is not a welcome. We need to do much more to become places where everybody feels they have a sense of ownership. Okay. Now, then we talk about the, how the marketplace yeah. has... Well, this is literally the sustainability of the museum about... Um, Museums continuing in this model of a lot of private donations, patronage, philanthropy. I mean, how is it, has it had an undertow effect on the leadership and the programming? Comment on that. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily vis-a-vis -vis Tate. Does that, is that what has yielded this whole slew of blockbuster shows? We, we, what, well, what, has, what has happened to, we've talked, we're talking about a period of huge change. Yeah. Uh, within the public sector. But what has not changed is the business model, the systems, the structures that underpin the museum. And so museums are working with a set of priorities that are increasingly out of kilter with what they would really like to do. So as a, in my short tenure at Tate Modern, my as it were, vision or mission. I think I glibly uh, once described the museum of my dreams to be a university with a playground attached. And by that I meant I wanted the museum to be able to continue to hold 
the scholarship, the knowledge, the research, to be at the cutting edge of rethinking art history, looking back on the past, taking the past to the future. But I wanted to do it in such a way that there were entry points from you know, almost cradle to grave and that nobody would be left to heart behind in that journey. Now, that, that's a very, very ambitious thing to do. But when they looked at my, you know, the pie chart of my resources, it was quite clear that 80% of my budget and my resources were being invested in the university part of that metaphor and only 20% in the playground. Now, if we want to be... Now, what is that university part, though? What did so you the mean university by that? part, if you like, that. is that the vast majority of visitors, probably to first sight as well, I'm sure in this room here, and certainly at Tate, to uh, all programmes that have a pay bar across them, for example, are highly educated, university educated, many of them with postgraduate degrees, who come from traditional middle class, upper middle class families. So a public institution with public funds invested it is principally privileging audiences who are already privileged. And that seems to me to be a major problem for an institution, however it's funded, that purports to be public facing. And in terms of its sustainability, when you think about investing in your future audience, if you're not bringing young people into the institution, now it's a little bit like the demographic we were talking about earlier, you have to invest in now, in the longer term, to ensure your sustainability in the future, which museums are not doing. So the demographic is getting older and older. I mean, rather, museums have actually um, gone on huge spending sprees in the last 15 years or so. Um, even under your own tenure. Can you speak to that also? Because that's also a fundamental part of the business model, which I think that you, you believe needs to be rejiggered. Well, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about, uh, well, I suppose most institutions, particularly cultural institutions, that we tend to be able to change when we bring more money into the institution. So for me, the two big moments of a kind of institutional change were firstly in 2000 when Tate Modern was built. A huge public and private investment. But when you do something for the first time, you can rethink it. So the model that we introduced in 2000 was effectively a new model, which was fantastic. And the other moment of real change that I was involved in was in... You mean the, the curation model? Or what, 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 what well, part the, are the you whole, referring the, to? The, Tate Modern is a new museum. It, to, to a degree, broke with the existing model of Tate. Okay, which I mean, was? Which was, which was, which the, was sort of the temple and after. model, stairs up. Okay. You know, so the, the, the idea of the turbine hall, the covered street, bringing the Less reverential. Into the institution, putting play at its center, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was more of a sort of um, hybrid of the kind of, the, think about the, um, you know, the Museum of Modern Art model in New York of the kind of modernist white cube gallery, but, but brought together with what you might call the Pompidou, the kind of, um, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of more open democratic model. So there was a hybrid, but it, was, it came about because it was an addition rather than a shift. Tate Modern was a new thing. It wasn't a, a change to Tate's whole business model. The other major shift was in the, um, in around from about 2007, when uh, we were, uh, and this is when I was the director of the collection, is that we took the decision that we, we had to, it was, in, it was a moral imperative to build, rebuild the collection or extend the collection to reflect the kind of demographic of London or the demographic of, of the UK, but also ref, to reflect the international global nature of contemporary art. And that began this process of uh, raising money and bringing in art from uh, centres of creativity that previously might have been thought of as marginal. So art from the Middle East, from Asia, uh, from Latin America, from Africa, and so on. And again, that was a very, very, it was a paradigm shift in behavior that was, that was funded by increased cash, but it in, in no way impacted on the principal, you know, primary kind of roots and, roots and, and structure of the institution itself. 
So both of those things, both the the, the birth of Tate, the, the, the bringing together of Tate Modern and the extension of the collection were really major growth elements. And that is the, it's the idea that you can continue to change by growing or you could, that I think we need to challenge now. So to give you that example, the, the collection has grown in the most wonderful way. It is truly international. And yet what it is effectively is a, I think we call them stranded assets in economic terms. Right. We have built a huge collection that um, effectively now is so big that only 50% of it will ever be shown to the public. So the great endeavor of that adventure, which in one sense has been so successful because it now does reflect a much more diverse international community and different types of art practice and different generations, is, is, is out of sync with the structure of the institution itself. So how do you bring these things together? I mean, um, now, by the way, I wanted, uh, now, I, I understand that when you increased the acquisition activity of Tate, it was to diversify the collection to reflect, to, to create a, a more diverse collection and to reflect more marginal populations uh, within the permanent collection. But I also wanted to talk about just the general, the fact that museums have these enormous permanent collections and that they've had some pernicious effects on the art industry in general. And, and what are some of those? Because I think that this is also a commentary on the art industry's obsession with certain modes of yeah, certain okay. kinds of objects, certain, ki certain modes of acquisition and, and collecting and the overall yeah. art industry business model. Well, in, in a way, you could argue that the, the emphasis on collecting and accumulation has taken away from the emphasis on experiencing art or participating in art. So when you look at the investment in collecting from collectors and institutions, it's, it, 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 it's hugely disproportionate to the investment in the visitor experience. So, you know, we're now museums. And it's interesting, the British Museum has been in the, the headlines recently. And you think of the enormous scope of the British Museum collection, much of which will never, ever, ever be experienced in the lifetime of any of us or our children or our children's children. And we, you know, I think we need to start thinking about lifespan and life expectancy, not just of ourselves, but also the objects in our care. Okay. And we're in, are they the right priorities? Right. There's a hugely disproportionate uh, emphasis on collecting to displaying objects, for example. Yes, yes. Or, or just under-investing in the visitor yeah. experience vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the uh, investment in the permanent collection. Um, I think it's also important to underscore that this model has also led to the reinforcement of certain categories of art. Well, it, it's, it, of course it's easier to collect a painting than a performance. It's easier to collect a sculpture than a video. Um, so, of course, it has fueled a marketplace in object-based practices. And do you believe that art galleries, who, which have grown into large, I mean, large businesses, have exercised an outsized influence on that, on that phenomenon? Outsized influence, I'm not so sure, but they're certainly part of the conversation. Okay, okay. Um, now, how would you write this imbalance? So how would you, if you had to build a museum from scratch, and, uh, and we're talking about a museum, meaning with a permanent collection as opposed to a gallery. Now, so what is the right balance to strike and how would you reconfigure the museum so that it could be more sustainable? Well, I, in, a, in a way, I think increasingly that a, a distributed model might be more interesting than, than a centered model. And I think it's an extraordinary that somewhere like Tate has this great collection and the British Museum does, but I also come to first sight and I see no collection. And I do think that, you know, there, that, that maybe there is a kind of... You know, we talk about leveling up in terms of funding, but also museums have extraordinary resources that aren't just financial. And so what would it look if we rethought how we, that, that ownership model and can ownership be collective and can works of art be shown outside the institutions who acquired them? And one of the interesting things about, one of the really, really huge burdens for um, you know, climate 
uh, emissions burdens of a museum is the way we uh, look after and store works of art. Um, almost refrigerated in the most extraordinary climatic conditions because museums uh, have for many years been committed to acquiring and then uh, looking after works as if they were new. So works of art, unlike people, never get old. They never age. Once they're shown, they go back and they rest in storage. Um, what if we were to think of that there is a lifespan? Wow. If, we, if we thought of works of art having lifespans, then the lives of those works would be in the public domain. You know, we have a choice. Either we keep works of art in perpetuity, as if they were just born, you know, hot from the easel. Right, cryogenically frozen. And therefore never seen. I mean, I'm obviously exaggerating. Or maybe we accept the fact that these works have a lifespan and that life should be full of exposure and bring pleasure to communities across okay. the UK. So one of the answers is to travel and to these, these permanent collections should be enjoyed by the entire country. Yeah. And among all the, all, all, many, all, all manner of art institutions. Well, it, it, we have a, there was a small part of Tate's collection called Artist Rooms, which f was formed out of a gift of a former dealer, Anthony Doffe, which he partly gave to Tate, um, but with the commitment from Tate and National Gallery of Scotland, with whom Tate shares it, that the work should be available to lend to regional galleries. Now, that, that is a, it's a small number of works. Maybe it's, I don't know, is it 7,000 works? But they, those individual exhibitions have transformed the audiences and the experiences of those galleries and museums where they have been shown. And that kind of access and sharing on a wider basis would be transformative. Yes. And then uh, I want to come back to the, the museum leadership and the tenden there has been a really marked and obvious tendency to um, offer up kind of a slate of predictable blockbusters. Yep. What kind of leadership do we need in order to break that mold and to become, how do museums, in, in the sense of curation and programming, how do we need to move on from what seems to be the prevailing norm? Well, I think the... the, the, the the commit with the um, you know the, the the dependency on blockbusters of course comes from a sense of financial necessity and a sense of uh, a risk aversion and i think probably all museums and i was doing a lot of thinking around this need to think okay so if we are going to wean ourselves off the blockbuster and the we the reason we need to wean ourselves off the blockbuster is they put yet more public resources or more resources into a very small number of artists who are already massively overexposed. Now, you know, I, was, I was really astonished when I read the, the roundup um, in the FT around the kind of um, highlights of uh, programme 2023, which was, uh, I think it was like 90% of the, 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 the exhibitions highlighted were sort of the early modern generation of blockbusters from Van Gogh to, um, uh, to Cezanne, and then to Hockney, and almost no artists who are not household names. But museums do have the power to build household names. And certainly during the seven years that I was uh, director at Tate Modern, working with an amazingly brave and brilliant curatorial team, we managed to completely turn around the visitor statistics for, for example, unknown women artists. Because, you know, we, a colleague of mine called blockbusters trust builders, but actually museums, if they behave correctly, can be trust builders too. So we all need to be less risk averse and to put to the fore artists that we really believe in, not just those ones that we know are gonna tick the box. Okay, great. Okay, um, I'd like to now take some questions from the audience. Oh, wow. Oh. Nick Charrington. Wait, wait for the mic. Sarah, Sorry. take my uh, uh, Nick Charrington. I, I'm really interested in, in what you're saying about, as it were, sharing out the collections around the country. We've, you've got the um, Garfield Western Trust and the, the Western Loan Program, and we've been trying to sort of work with, with that a bit, just to have a, a sort of exhibition uh, where we live about the history of the place, which we'd put on in a couple of years. And I approached um, 
the Essex County Council and basically got a, a, a sort of a, we just haven't got the resources to help you on this. And, uh, and then that, the sort of sense that from one or two other museums that their trustees have this sort of legal obligation to look after this stuff in perpetuity. And so lending it out is almost an impossibility because they'd be, they'd be breaking their, the sort of scheme of their charity. Um, there's, there's some huge, uh, I think it's more in people's heads than anything else, but, but there's, there's, yeah, I think, I, I think it, it fe it's felt very solid, the sort of resistance, the block. Yes, well, I suppose I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to um, maybe, uh, you know, unbalance that, that, that um, sense of, uh, in a way, complacency. It's very easy to fall back on museums' agreements with governments through the DCMS, and museums sign those, re-sign those agreements every two years. So they are effectively renegotiable. But we do have in this country a... As you say, you're absolutely right. There is a commitment to um, that museums need to look after their collections in perpetuity, and that we don't deaccession work. So we we ca cannot give work away effectively. But I do think we need to challenge that. You know, as a sector, we need to we need to work together to challenge the DCMS on the uh, imposition of a set of priorities that felt right in 1992, but don't feel right in 2024. And there is a, you know, there's a National Museums Directors Council. Uh, there, are, there are close connections, there's daily conversations between museums and the DCMS. And we actually need to be brave about having those conversations. But, uh, you know, I can't tell you how difficult it is to challenge those conventions around collecting. Okay, there was a lady over there. She runs a museum. I do. I run a distributed museum. Um, my question, though, is about culture declares emergency. So with Heather over there, um, I'm a co-founder, and, and Francis, you were very generous and supportive when we came to you and asked if you would support us and declare. Um, and so my question is really about the impact that that had. You know, did it? Um, what, what changes happened as a result, if any? Um, and maybe comment more broadly on the impact of our movement. Well, thank you for, uh, fa thank you for asking that question. And thank you, um, above all, for uh, coming into the Turbine Hall and asking us to declare um, a climate and ecological emergency, which we did. And I think the, um, the impact of making that declaration public was pretty immediate and relatively profound but I'm not sure how, um, well, how long its tail is. Because I think what, what it did was that it made the institution very aware of um, its carbon footprint and uh, Tate, uh, undertook a really great piece of work with Julie's Bicycle to, uh, to understand where its carbon footprint lay and made some... Uh, some, made some very quick and sensible decisions around how to cut those carbon emissions to the extent that uh, it has now achieved its goal of 50% reduction, I think a year ahead of, of planned. But I think what, uh, and it, but I have to say all those things that it did were the, the low hanging fruit. It, it isn't that difficult to change your energy supplier. It isn't that difficult. And Rachel Kent, my colleague, who really oversaw all many of the program, the changes to the way we built programs, built exhibitions, uh, transported works, you know, dealing with scope one and scope two emissions, the things in your control, are very straightforward. What is less straightforward are the things that lie slightly beyond that. So, for example, when we're talking about sustainability, coming back to the civic thing, one of the reasons that we really need to have a, a, be embedded in a community is that we need local audiences. Uh, Tate Modern, for example, all, over 50% of its audience is international from abroad. Now, that's, that's a big, that's a very scary in terms of longer term sustainability, what happens if the suddenly people stop flying? You know, we will lose half our audience. So the longer term impacts of 
that declaration are going to be much more difficult to think through because we have less control over them. And the, that's what I, in a way, would love, uh, not just Tate, but all institutions to be thinking, is that now we've done the easy bits, let's look at our deeper behaviours, our structures, our systems. Do we really want this model? Is it serving our purpose? Is our purpose to make enough money to go on collecting at this rate? Or is it to provide extraordinary experiences for our local communities? Yeah, no, that's a really well said about the whole mission statement. That, that young lady up there, please. Thank you. Um, so a little bit related to that question. Um, I very much liked your description of a museum, Francis, as I've got it wrong, I think a hospital, a school and what was park. it? Park. It's a park and a home. <laughs> and, and a home. I think that's wonderful. And does that perhaps suggest that museums have a kind of responsibility um, to show a kind of ethical leadership? Um, and in that, I mean, following on from that question, not so much to do with... Um, a carbon footprint analysis, but perhaps their part that they could play in public messaging. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot with this, but I feel it has to be brought up because it's been in the news recently. Given the absolute critical moment we're in with a climate emergency, and given that we're seeing a lack um, of honest public messaging about this, and also a lack of political leadership, and in fact, a sort of dishonest men messaging from our political leadership, can I ask for your thoughts on the British Museum's decision to accept a large package of funding from BP? Okay, that, which is the question you want me... I'm, I'm, I'm appalled by the, British Mu the trustees of the British Museum's decision to accept BP money. I'm absolutely appalled. I'm also interested... I, you know, the, the absence of ethics there, just and, and the, uh, the loss of public credibility as a result, seems to me too high a price to pay. Um, simple as that. I do think that the, with the civic role of a museum comes the responsibility to uh, speak on behalf of, but in alignment with your communities. And one of the, a couple of the, the, the projects that I've been involved in at Tate Modern that meant most to me uh, were those projects when we aligned with our local community. And one, for example, was in 2017 when we worked with the artist Tanya Bergera, the Cuban activist work, and she put together a group of uh, neighbours um, who came from the uh, vicinity of Bankside, and they included some of the uh, community of the original Liberate Tate uh, activists who helped bring down BP from... Uh, the Tate's um, funding, you know, um, community. And one of the things that we did a, as a result of working with Tanya, the, 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 the neighbours were very um, anxious that we should find a way of acknowledging the importance and power of community. Uh, we already um, uh, acknowledged the importance and power of money by putting patrons' names all over the buildings. And that led to the naming of our original building uh, after a local community worker, Natalie Bell. And for me, in my seven years as director, that was the single most... It felt to me that was the single most powerful thing that I could possibly involved with. I think the second most important thing was acknowledging that when culture declares came to take, that was the community of London artists who were coming and asking us to help them amplify their voices. And so I do think that the role of museums is incredibly important, not just saying what they think, but reflecting back to the wider public the thoughts and beliefs and concerns of their constituents. And for a museum like Tate, of course, it's contemporary artists. Anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to ask one last important question. Oh, was there? Oh, there's another question there. Okay, I might ask my question anyway, but please go ahead. Uh, oh, Sally. Hi, <laughs> Sally from First Sight. <laughs> um, one little note about collections and receiving collections. I don't particularly want a collection. <laughs> They're extremely expensive to look after, and we have limited funds, and I'd rather spend them on what you've been talking about, which is enhancing people's experience of art in the first instance and making sure more people come in. My question is maybe a bit of a pickle. <laughs> uh, 
and maybe a bit uh, provocative, but on the BP point, where does good money come from? Tate is built on sugar money and colonialism. Is there not a way that we can use money in a new way, bad or good, whatever good and bad money is? Is that a more creative approach? I don't know if it's possible, but could the British Museum have said, we'll take this money on the condition that? There's, wherever money comes from, it's generally not a brilliant place, and we need to be really transparent about that across the board. Most of my money comes from <laughs> Rishi Sunak. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not happy money. We have a responsibility as cultural organisations to creatively transform things and make things visible. How do we do this? You know, there is money out there to do good things. We, we seem constantly stuck with the resources question. How do we... How do we how do we break that cycle? I don't understand how to do it. Well, yeah. We need money. <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm going to accept <laughs> money from BP. They're not offering me any at the moment. you know. But is there not a way to kind of open up a new type of relationship that is a global conversation about how do we collectively rectify the situation? You know, you were talking about neoliberalism, but the problem of sustainability is, is the Industrial Revolution which is a British invention. <laughs> Don't we as British organisations have a responsibility to really dig right down to the major problems of a colonial model and think about how we rectify all of that, including the money? Uh, that's not, uh, it's yeah. a lot of statements. Well, yeah, really but in a way, you're, you're talking about two things. Firstly, the BP thing. I mean, all money is tainted, you're absolutely right, including government money. I mean, you know, if you were going to give up your sponsors on ethical grounds, you'd probably ditch the government. But the BP thing is, uh, there is a case in point then, that it would have been such a powerful message not to take BP money, that they really missed a trick. It's not just about the money, it was about the message it sent. So that is one thing. But the, the other thing about, you know, the, 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 the bigger picture, I think that maybe institutions like Tate do need to think about how much money they need and how much money they're making that they're not putting to good purpose, for example. So I take the... I mean, I, of course, I love... I think collections are incredibly important. I'm, it's very difficult to be... to have the nuance and the complexity of an argument in, in half an hour in a context like this. And I'm passionate about works of art in collections, but I also worry about setting up a system that's about raising money to buy more art that then costs a lot to store that's never seen. And I'm, I'm very happy you don't want Tate's collection, but <laughs> if anybody does, works from a collection can be an amazing honeypot to bring people into your institution. You found other ways of doing it, but lots of museums, lots of, you know, it really can help. But I... <laughs> No, but it's not about that. It's about there's an invitation. If you want it, it's here. At the moment, that is not the case. It's almost impossible to borrow anything from a national museum. It's very difficult if you're first sight, you've got one little air-conditioned gallery. It's even more difficult if you're a youth centre or a, or a school or a university. So I think that, that is one thing that we need to look at. Then the, what you're talking about, I say neoliberalism, you are talking about precisely the, the, the system you know, the political system, the, 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 the structure of state support. Now, you can't take that on, on your own, but that is what you're talking about. We have to find a way of convincing people that culture matters. And at the moment, we have a... And this is your last question. I was going to be... Yes, a, excellent. The nature of art. Excellent. But, you know, at the moment, we live in a culture that only values... Ex, that only measures extrinsic value. KPIs you know, fig tickets, bums on seats, whatever, with the, there's no way of measuring or valuing the intrinsic value. And we, everybody in this room knows the intrinsic value of culture, of art. So how are we going to demonstrate that? But, you know, neuroscientists understand why it works. 
we understand. We, when you see a, a child aged 18 months reaching for a pencil in one hand and a football, the, the both play and art come right from the very earliest age. We're very good as a nation at supporting football from cradle to grave, but we're not good at doing art. We need to, as institutions, make more of a, a case for that. Okay, wow. We, no, no, we must. We're actually uh, significantly over time now, but that was fantastic, uh, Francis. Huge food for thought. And um, I think it'll give everybody a little bit of stuff to think about when they go to a museum. Okay, thank you. Please put your hands together for Francis.